you can accomplish anything you want in the world as long as you are willing to outwork people. I think there's a lot of people, especially young people today, who want instant results. They want to immediately get wealthy or you know accomplish their goal or, or whatever. And as you get older, you just realize like, look, you got to enjoy that the work of it, and the outcome kind of takes care of itself. Every entrepreneur, every business leader has gotten their you know what kick. Jeff Bezos, the stock implodes, goes down 90%. Michael Dell, the laptop in 1993 are catching on fire. Bill Gates, the first operating system doesn't work. Him and Paul Allen are trying to figure out what to do. And they're on a deadline with IBM. Elon Musk on his knees. It's an 08. Okay, I'm going to be insolvent. He's on his knees and he finds a way to figure it out. And he's got two amazing companies. He's the richest commercial billionaire in the world. Bad things can happen to you or setbacks that you don't anticipate, but you've got to get through them. Okay, so joining us now on Open Book is a uh, dear friend, fellow Italian. Title of the book, How to Live an Extraordinary Life by Anthony Pompliano, who's incredibly well-adjusted for an Italian-American. Okay, yeah, I, would have, I would have found you to be a little crazier, to be honest, like, like the rest of us, Anthony. So let's start there. How did you grow up? Just tell us quickly how you grew up. Um, in my family, there's five boys. I'm the oldest of five. Uh, my parents uh, were smart enough to let us get into tons of trouble and do dumb things, but uh, also love us at the same time and uh, convince us that, uh, you know, maybe we could make something out of ourselves if we worked hard. Okay. This book is a gem. Okay. And tell me what you were trying to accomplish with this book. I've actually read the book twice. It's an easy read, uh, but it's loaded with uh, terrific observations. So, and you're a young guy. How old are you? Aunt? 36. All right. So you're a young guy. Okay. This is the type of book that a 70 year old or an 80 year old could have written. So let's talk about that. What were you trying to accomplish with, with this book? And where did you get this type of wisdom? Well, my incredibly intelligent, good-looking friend, Anthony Scaramucci, had written a number of best-selling books. And so I was like, you know, I can't let him have all the fun. Oh, my God. So you're so it. full I, of I, shit. I, Give me the I, fucking I real answer, okay? I mean, this is the Mooch's podcast, but it's your show. Give me the real answer, Pomp. Give me the real answer. <laughs> Come on. No, um, look, I I, uh, I started writing some of the letters to my kids. Um, my wife really pushed me, I think, to to uh, write the first one. And um, I just, after I wrote, I don't know, five, six, seven of them, uh, figured, well, there's probably people other than my kids uh, who could benefit from uh, from reading these. And um, we put it into a book. We published it. The only problem is I now have people throughout my life that read the book, and then they start repeating back to me the lessons at the most inopportune times. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now, now yeah, that now, always happens. Recognizing yeah. my own insights against me. All right, right. When you when you're going when you're going over the boundaries of the Pompliano book, that remind you. But, but you know, Pomp, honestly, there's several different topics in this book that I want to address with you. Okay. The, the first one is non-reciprocity, okay, or non-linear. And what I mean by that, the genius of your book is to be non-transactional, to be non-linear, you know, to call your friends for no reason, to reach out to people, to make the anonymous check to a charity, not even for the charity, but because for yourself, because it makes you feel good, you know. So, so tell somebody who's cynical, uh, why that is not only a way to live an extraordinary life, but actually makes you very happy and makes you very balanced on the inside. Yeah, I, I think most people are optimizing for what do I get out of life? And what I've found is um, what you put into life drastically determines what you get out of it. And so if you think about uh, investing, the amount of work you put in will determine the return you pull out. If you think of relationships, the amount of effort or time you put in uh, will determine the joy that you get out of it. You kind of just go throughout life and um, it's a lot like leadership. You know, a lot of people think uh, leadership is all about kind of beating your chest and, hey, I'm in charge. Uh, but what you find is the best leaders understand that leadership is about service. How do you serve the people that you're supposed to be leading? And so I think that that is a key theme throughout the book because it's just true. You write in this book on page 125 something that is incredibly hard for people to do. Okay, so I'm going to read what you wrote. Your life changes once you realize that no one else's opinion matters as long as you know who you are. Or as my grandmother would say, what other people think of you is none of your business. Now, you know, I've been brutalized in the press. I've been ripped up, particularly after my White House firing. And this is a hard thing to do. Okay, I'm not I'm not saying I'm perfect at it, but I think I'm pretty good at it because I don't give a shit. Okay, and I've been able to release myself 
from what you describe as a mental prison where I don't really care what other people think about me. Here, I'll show you something. Okay, look, this is me sinking in a Bitcoin boat. See, this is the, we got comedians at Skybridge, right? So they made a bobblehead of me, right? Look at me sinking in the Bitcoin boat because I was getting torched in Bitcoin about two years ago after the FDX debacle. You either give a shit, Anthony, or you don't. How, how do you get your mindset around not giving a shit? I once heard um, a quote that said something to the effect of, um, don't worry about the opinions of people you wouldn't ask advice from. And so there's this thought process of, uh, if you know who you are, if the people around you know who you are, then just keep going forward. And the world is full of kind of short termism and people will jump from, you know, whatever the latest shiny thing is to the next one uh, very quickly. But what I have found is if you take the perspective, whenever you're going through the shit, what, what can I learn from this? What can I take away? And um, the more that you can, you know, glean insights or glean lessons from even the bad times, uh, it in a weird way makes you thankful for them. And so, you know, yeah, you got fired from the White House, but you probably learned a lot about yourself and what you want out of life and, you know, the type of person you are. And so in a weird way, uh, it may be one of the most positive impact, you know, situations that you lived in your life, uh, but it's all about mindset. It's all about, you know, did I actually take information out of this uh, or did I just get punched in the face and, you know, everyone made fun of me on the internet and uh, and that's all that uh, situation. Yeah, but, but, but does it really affect my life? I'm still having my, look, I got my Starbucks. I'm still having my Starbucks. Still good looking. You're still athletic. You're still rich. Like we get it. We're, we're trying yeah, to all yeah, get yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah, this is why you're so good. Flattery will get you everywhere with the Scaramucci's, okay? All right, so listen, I've got limited time with you. I want you to say something to me that you don't usually say to people. There's something inside Pompliano's brain that you don't share. There's something, there's a self-talk, there's a self-philosophy, there's something going on in the Pompliano brain that I want you to share with us. What is it? Well, I think there's there's two things that probably um, people would appreciate. One, and, and Italians more so than most, I think, uh, uh, understand this, but uh, my wife and I always repeat the same thing to each other uh, at different you know times uh, throughout our life, which is like it ends with us. And it's this idea that um, when you grow up, you are taught a bunch of things. You you pick up habits, you pick up uh, different components. Thankfully, the bad habits in my life are not uh, alcoholism or you know very serious things, but simple things like growing up. You know, we used to eat a very carb heavy diet at nine p.m. every night. You're kind of a classic Italian family. And so that's probably not the healthiest thing. And this idea of like it ends with us is ending these kind of generational uh, situations where we just said, look, we're going to eat healthy and we're not going to eat at 9 p.m. And, you know, I know that I grew up in that household, you know, doing that, but, but that's not what I want for my kids. And, and so we're going to go a different direction. So I think a lot of people, they feel empowered when they realize like you can change those generational things if, uh, if you recognize them and, and then are intentional about it. And then the second thing is, um, you know, it's weird to say out loud, but you can accomplish anything you want in the world as long as you are willing to outwork people. And I do think there are many times throughout the week where I will say to myself, whether something's going well, not going well, whatever, it's just like, just keep working hard and it'll work out. And I think there's a lot of people, especially young people today who, you know, they want instant results. They want to, you know, immediately get wealthy or, or you know, accomplish their goal or, or whatever. And as you get older, you just realize like, look, you got to enjoy that, you know, the work of it. Um, and the outcome kind of takes care of itself. I think that you, I think you are, uh, I think you are a generational entrepreneur. I really do believe that about you. I've, I've said this to you privately. I mean, I think you have the DNA and the mechanisms of being uh, a generational entrepreneur, not only just in terms of your philosophy, Munger liked philosophy, but also, you know, if I could buy stock in you personally, I would. Um, but I want you to tell me about a failure. I want you to maybe tell me about a Pompliano setback, okay, that you've had to deal with either personally or professionally. And what went through your mind and did it change your mindset or not? And I'll just give you mine. When I got fired brutally from the White House, I think it made me more psychologically minded. I think it made me more empathetic for other people. Okay. And perhaps I was a little bit too detached from other people and I have to own that, but tell me about you and potential pitfall that you've had. 
Yeah, probably the biggest uh, professional one was um, the bankruptcy of BlockFi. You know, we were uh, the second largest investor there. Um, I've been very public about, you know, kind of my uh, my, my thoughts of how okay, well- Okay, so I'm going to interrupt you for a second. Some of the people may not know BlockFi. So what BlockFi was, it was a crypto lending facility. You could put your Bitcoin into BlockFi and they would give you a return. They would lend out your Bitcoin to other people. And unfortunately, during the FTX debacle, in the Bitcoin crash of 2022, they became insolvent. Uh, FTX, a, a company that I'm very well familiar with and actually sold a piece of my company, uh, was about to take it over, but FTX went bankrupt and it imploded BlockFi. Okay, go. I'm sorry, Ann. I just need to give some background okay. to people. I, I think it's helpful. Um, and so, you know, during that, there's a couple of different things that I think, you know, um, in that experience. One is uh, the company didn't really do anything that was uh, malicious, nefarious, et cetera. They basically, they did business with somebody who did that stuff. Um, and so you kind of get the knock on effect, which obviously um, isn't, uh, isn't ideal. On top of that, uh, obviously my personal uh, reputation, you know, the thoughts that I had put out there, I had a pretty uh, pristine record uh, before that, but it was the first time that um, I had to go to investors and say, hey, listen, you know, this isn't going to go the way that we want it to go, et cetera. And what I think it did was it reminded me that, you know, everything doesn't go up. Uh, you're not always right. And there was a little bit of a, like an intellectual uh, humbling or, or humility that it injected. And what I think is probably the single best part of that entire situation is in a weird way, I walked away saying, hey, the investing style that I pursue is correct. You know, the company went from zero to three plus billion dollars in about three years. Um, but you have to remember that just because something is working at one point, you know, it doesn't always mean that it's going to work forever. And so it was just, you know, you, you got to take your lumps, you, you got to take the losses. Um, and, you know, those losses were both in our portfolio for me personally. Um, but but I do think that, um, again, it, it, it's only in hindsight, can you say, hey, I learned something from that situation. Uh, and then you got to go and you got to make sure that you implement whatever those lessons are uh, moving forward. Okay, but it didn't change your self esteem. It didn't alter your self confidence. It didn't alter your family life, right? And so there's a lesson here, right? That bad things can happen to you or setbacks that you don't anticipate or certainly don't wish for, but you've got to get through them, right? And I, I would say this to Anthony, I want you to react to it. Every entrepreneur, every business leader has gotten their you know what kicked, every single one of them, okay? Jeff Bezos, the stock implodes, goes down 90%. Michael Dell, the laptops in 1993 are catching on fire. Uh, the company, the stock goes from 41 to 7. He's got to rebuild the company. I don't know an entrepreneur. Bill Gates, the first operating system doesn't work. Him and Paul Allen are trying to figure out what to do. Uh, they're on a deadline with IBM. I mean, you name the company. I can tell you a story about the trials and tribulations. Elon Musk on his knees. Listen to Elon Musk on his knees in 08. Okay, I'm going to be insolvent. He's he's on his knees. And he finds a way to uh, figure it out. And he's got two amazing companies. He's the richest uh, commercial billionaire in the world. There are political billionaires worth more. So so what's the lesson in? You have to tell me who's uh, who's richer than him. There sounds like there's a story there. Oh, uh, come on. Putin is, Putin is a lot richer than him. Come on, my man. You're not so. stupid. How much money do you think he's got? Putin? Yeah, no, nah, he's got a he's got a, he's got a one T Putin. He's I mean, got come on. First oh, 100 percent. Well, come on. He controls the company. These are oligarchs. They took they plundered the comp the country, man. Come on. <laughs> um, I think I think the big lesson is very rich in the United States as an entrepreneur. You can get richer if you control a con country with load loaded with natural resources. You just put it in your pocket. Right. Yeah. But this is the problem with the egos. Right. The egos are such. I want my neighbors to do well. And so do you. I don't want to live in a Bob Wired man mansion with a security compound while my fellow neighbors are suffering. You know what I mean? Well, the secret is um, the quality of life improves the richer your neighbors get. Right. If you think about yeah, exactly. kind of living in, inside that uh, that barbed wire fence, um, it's not very fun. If you can't leave, you're basically right. just imprisoned by the wealth. And so I do think that there's something about uh, you want society to win uh, because it makes everything around you better. Right. If the small business owner down the street has more resources, a better business, uh, can better service uh, the customers, et cetera, it, it improves the life for everybody. And so, you know, it's kind of capitalism at work. So. So. All right. I got four minutes to go with you. OK. What's the 66th lesson that you learned 
from the experience of writing your first book and becoming a published author? I think that the whole book process is uh, very broken. I was fortunate to work with a publisher that I think is pretty forward thinking um, in terms of what they do, but um, product market fit is a hell of a thing and books have it, right? You know, books have been published for hundreds, if not thousands of years, and uh, we're still reading them today. And so with all the technology, with all the different things that have happened in society, and it just reminds you that, especially for people in technology that are constantly thinking about what's gonna get disrupted, there are things, there are form factors, there are technology um, that don't change and they don't change for centuries. And so uh, sometimes you might want to not only find the things that are going to disrupt or change, but you also may want to um, find the things that are not going to change and bet along those trends as well. Okay, ready? I got five words for you. I'm going to say the word. You're going to say what goes on in your head. Ready? Yeah. I say the word mindset. Toughness. Okay. I say the word family. Love. I say life. Short. So how about the word extraordinary? Whatever you want it to be. Okay. All right. This word has four syllables. It's a long word, Ant. Okay. I say the word Pompliano. I'll keep the uh, first word that thought that came to my brain uh, to myself, but um, no, I just think. Uh, come fun. on, well, I mean, come on! I, I need ratings for this podcast. What's wrong with you? Come on! I mean, Italians are not like that. We wear everything on our sleeve. What's the first word that came to your mind? Cut it out, Ian. What is it? Fun. fun. Yeah. All right, good. Yeah, I mean, all right, okay. What was the second word? What was the second word? You were going to say something I, I, like I, sensible. I forgot it already. All right, so you're here to have fun. Yeah. Look. If life is short, if you want to live it, your version of an extraordinary life, you got to have to be enjoyed. You know, it's a gift. It's meant to be enjoyed. And you have to look at it that way, you know, and Mel Brooks says, relax. None of us are getting out of here alive, right? You got to live it that way. What are you going to do? You get, what are you going to do? You yeah. know, I want to, I want to see 2150 in, I want to see 2224, 200 years from where we are right now. I want to see what happens. But I'm not going to be able to because I'm going to be out of here. You know, it's just that you're in a little decaying you're, time you're vessel. Be you know? watching, uh, you're going to be watching from God mode. Yeah. Right? Well, well, yeah. Well, I hope so. I, who the hell knows? But, you know, my, my point is you got you to gotta enjoy life. The title of the book is How to Live an Extraordinary Life. It's by Anthony Pompliano. Bestseller. Uh, and I appreciate you coming on. But more important than that, uh, I appreciate you living the way you write about in the book. Keep it up, Ant. I appreciate you having me on. Thank you so much. I need you for the podcast because you know you're the star of the podcast, and I'm. When is it? I'm just, I have to start a lunch with my friends. Two you know? minutes. Two minutes. You ready? Yeah. All right. All right. So, Ma, I have a young friend of mine. His name is Anthony Pompliano, fellow Italian. Okay, and he wrote a great book. And he seems very happy and well-adjusted. So what do you think it is about Italian moms, Ma, that make uh, well-adjusted people? Well, they're very protective to their children. And a God forbid anyone steps on their toes. They're very defensive. Right. And um, and they, they, deep, they have like a deep love. They won't even let them go to camp because they're afraid something will happen to them. Right. Right. Okay. Let me ask you this though. If I shot somebody on Fifth Avenue, you would be defending me? No problem, right? Of course I would be, no matter what. No matter what. Doesn't matter, right? Could steamroll, Doesn't take, matter. take the car, knock out 100 people on the road, no problem, right? No problem. Okay. <laughs> Why though, Ma? Why are you so crazy? Um, my children are my whole life, though. I've made my uh, children become. I'm like obsessive with my children and my grandchildren. I, no one can hurt them. And then I, I, um, I'm probably over the top because I, I'm very protective of my kids. Okay. Let me, let me. And uh, I'm 80, going to be 88 years old in two months, and I still have that same strongness in me. Okay. So let me ask you this: At 88, okay, what's the <laughs> one, what's the one Marie Scaramucci life lesson? Go. Say that again. What's the one Marie Scaramucci life lesson? Life lesson? Yeah, what's a don't lesson? Be afraid, don't, 
don't be afraid of anyone. If you're, if you're first of all in life, you have to do good and forget it. And if you do bad, you got to remember it because the world will turn, and you have to pay for the bad. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I really believe that. All right, so don't fear anyone, but remember there's karma, right? And there's some level of yeah, cosmic absolutely. justice. All right. Absolutely.